Good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. My name is Kurt Volker. I have the distinct honor of being the executive director of the McCain Institute, and I'd like to welcome you all this here, here this evening. Uh, I also want to welcome some of the VIPs in our audience. We have uh, our, our friend, the Ambassador of Slovenia, Bozo Sarar. We have a few members of our Board of Trustees who are here. I, I know there are, there are others as well. I want to thank you for coming. The McCain Institute was founded to advance character-driven global leadership. Uh, we believe that there is a need to strengthen the commitment to core issues of character and values in the United States and around the world and to promote the kind of leadership that's going to carry us forward into the years and decades ahead. McCain Institute also takes on concrete programming in areas of human rights, humanitarian work, and national security. But one of our signature public events has been this debate and decision series where we try to bring out different points of view from the left and the right, from the center, arguing over what are the best choices that our country should be making in the challenges that face ourselves and, in fact, that face the world. We've done over a dozen of these debates, as you've seen in this introductory video. Uh, we run this in a structured and timed format. Each side will have four minutes to make an initial argument. Uh, each side will then have two minutes to rebut the arguments of the opposing side. And then there'll be an opportunity where the moderator will ask questions, and I have the honor of being your moderator this evening as well. Uh, and then we'll also have an opportunity for audience questions, and we'll give that to each of the sides as well. When we turn to the audience for questions, I would ask one favor from all of you. Do be brief. Uh, do make it a question so that it tees up an opportunity for our panelists, for our debaters, to really address the issue that, that is being brought up. Uh, this is being live webcast. It will also exist online. We, we capture it for video. As you see, we also do edited versions that we post online as well. We'll be, dis we'll be circulating decision notes afterwards, which recap some of the key arguments. I would encourage you to be active participants in our debate. Uh, silence your cell phones, but do tweet a, a hashtag as MIDebate. There is Wi-Fi here if you're not getting good phone reception, and the Wi-Fi and the password are at the back of the brochure that you picked up. So you'll be able to get on and be able to, to tweet. And if you post questions in there, we do have someone following the Twitter feed to see uh, what questions might be brought up, and those will be passed to me. Um, and as I said, do put the phones on vibrate so we, we don't have um, interference with the audio or the phones ringing uh, in the auditorium. Uh, we will go through... Uh, all of the uh, questions, and then at the end of our debate, we close by asking each of our participants uh, to give us a one-minute quick summary. What is their bottom line recommendation for what they would like to see the United States do right now? Tonight's debate raises a very important and difficult question, which is the relationship between U.S. foreign assistance and human rights. We know that there are challenges in the world that affect human rights. Some of these are caused by security problems. Some of them are caused by oppressive regimes. We see, as a result of this, often humanitarian disasters in parallel with this. We try to use U.S. foreign assistance to promote security, to promote uh, humanitarian relief and carry that out, to promote uh, economic development. But the question is, how do we navigate this minefield of giving aid that may, in fact, ignore a human rights situation or empower a regime that is abusing human rights or give them the arms and the tools that they may use and then oppressing their own population? To debate these questions tonight, we have four extraordinarily experienced and capable debaters, and I'll introduce them each in turn. Uh, first, uh, here closest to me is Daniel Rundy. Uh, Daniel is a former colleague uh, working in government. He is now at CSIS. He worked at AID for a number of years. And uh, he and Omer Ismail, who is from originally uh, Darfur and has been involved in a number of UN and uh, NGO efforts in providing relief in Darfur and arguing some of the policy positions about how Darfur should be addressed, including um, uh, some seminal work on the basis for declaring that the Darfur uh, killings were, in fact, a genocide. Uh, the two on that side will be arguing the case that we do need to condition our assistance on human rights. 
Further down, we have uh, at the end of the row, Andrew Natsios. Andrew Natsios was the director of USAID from 2001 to 2006, I believe. He then was the uh, US Special Envoy to the Sudan. He is now the director of the Scowcroft Institute, which is part of the Bush Center at, or the Bush, uh, I guess the Bush Presidential Center, the Bush School, thank you, the Bush School at Texas A&M University, and this is George H.W. Bush School at Texas A&M. And with him is Doug Ollivant. Doug served a number of tours in Iraq, uh, also in Afghanistan. He served in the National Security Council uh, for both President Bush and President Obama, working on Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, he continues to be very active in these issues now in his private sector life, both working for a consulting firm uh, which has offices uh, throughout Iraq, as well as being a fellow at the New America Foundation. Um, they will be arguing the case not so fast. We have a vast array of interests. Now, as you would imagine, there's a lot of middle ground, and I think you'll hear some of our debaters agreeing and sometimes disagreeing with each other. But uh, that's the nature of a serious debate where there is no black and white answer, but there's a lot of nuance. I want to start our debate then this evening by turning to our first team here uh, with this question, as we, as we were explaining it just a minute ago. When you have cases of regimes using their armed forces, using their police to abuse their population, you have cases of regimes controlling access to, to food or to humanitarian relief, you have gross violations of political rights, shouldn't that be a condition for the United States before deciding whether to provide aid to that country? Thanks, Thanks Mark. Thanks very much. Um, let me say a couple things at the beginning, which is that we want to have a world of as many states as possible participating in the rule-based order that was set up by the United States after World War II. It's in our interest to have free, uh, free societies that respect human rights. It makes us more secure, and so we want to move in that direction ultimately. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, so therefore, we should lead with our values. The United States should lead with our values, and we should use all instruments of statecraft uh, to push in the direction of human rights. <clears throat> Principles matter. Uh, they remind us of who we are as a people, and it's in our interest, as I said, to have a world that's democratic and respecting human rights. Um, so yes, we should use foreign assistance. We should look at uh, human rights, look through the lens of human rights when we make decisions about foreign assistance. In the case of food aid, almost in, almost in no circumstances should we use the uh, lens of human rights as the lens that we look at food aid because of the, uh, in, there are going to be, there are some extreme examples, but I think if, if people's lives are in danger, we should put that first. Um, in the case of development and military assistance, absolutely it should be one of the lenses that we look at. Let me just give a quick counterexample. Think of China, which is sort of the extreme realist school of foreign policy, or perhaps the amoral, pragmatic school of foreign policy. They will do business with anybody. Um, they treat people terribly. Um, they're a society that no one trusts their milk or their water. Expats are leaving their cities because they're so polluted. They uh, tell parents how many children they can have. They tell citizens where they can live, whether in the cities or not. Think about when they are the largest economy in the world and they are the writing the rules of the road uh, for the global order. We don't want that sort of a, of a rule-based order written by China. It's absolutely terrible. So I think we need to think about, first, we want to think about the direction we want to go, which is towards a system where people are participating in our rule-based order. And second, we don't want to move in the direction of a rule-based order set by China because, um, because they're, in essence, that, as I said, a, an extreme example of realism. Um, just a couple other points. I think promoting human rights and pursuing other foreign policy objectives are not mutually exclusive. I think we should be thinking about um, idealism grounded in pragmatism or pragmatism grounded in idealism. But yes, human rights should be one of the lenses that we look at in assistance. Um, there's just two things to think about, though. Foreign aid economic assistance isn't what it used to be. Uh, in 1990, as many as 95 countries, the largest foreign financial financing that they got was from foreign aid. Today, 43 countries, it's the largest amount of foreign financing that they get. Um, but there are examples where we've had to cut assistance. Think of Idi Amin in Uganda, uh, or in the case just recently this week, where we cut uh, military assistance. Uh, we significantly reduced it in Mexico because they were not certified 
uh, to having met certain human rights criteria has caused a sensation in Mexico. Okay. Omer, uh, a minute to continue. Thank you. Thanks to the McKenna Institute. It's great to see you here. Uh, some old friends and some new ones. I think um, the issue of aid, uh, to me, uh, is, is not uh, how other people look at it. Some people look at it as uh, one benevolent country or regime that is giving handouts to other regimes. Um, for me, uh, foreign aid is a transaction. It's a transaction between two countries, and it has its uh, interest rooted into it. And for that matter, I divide it into three categories. One is the emergency or humanitarian aid, and there is no qualm that the, this country or any country in the world should step up and help people in need. And we've seen cases like extreme cases, like in North Korea or now in Syria or in other places. Um, regardless of what kind of regime there, I think the people of that country deserve the help that is uh, being offered by the United States or any other country or the international organizations. Well, there are ways to go around. We'll come back to you because you'll have a chance after we hear from the other side. But I want to give the opportunity to Andrew and Doug now to make their case, uh, which is uh, really addressing this question. Yes, of course you want to condition it on human rights, but isn't it really a case-by-case -case judgment? Don't you really have to look at who you're talking about, what the issue is? Can you really deny humanitarian relief when it's needed? Can you really uh, put aside security if that's going to be the paramount issue that you're dealing with? Let me turn first to Andrew. Let me su suggest several propositions to answer the question being debated. First, all human rights abuses are not the same. They are all objectionable, but some are more objectionable than others. For example, genocide and mass atrocities are not the same as restrictions on freedom of the press or uh, arresting people without um, adequate evidence. Uh, mass atrocities are completely unacceptable under any circumstances. The U.S. government should act to sanction any regime in every way they can. However, however, while we can end economic and development aid that goes to or through uh, uh, predatory abuse of governments, which are looting their own country's resources, committing widespread atrocities, the U.S. government should not end all aid programs. Aid programs can be carried out by NGOs, USAID contractors, or universities. In fact, there isn't that much aid that actually goes through the coffers of other governments. We, do, we just don't do that because the money disappears, even in governments that are relatively democratic and friendly to us. There are three categories of aid should be protected from any cuts, in my view, under any circumstances. One is humanitarian assistance in civil wars. Frequently, the people we're providing it to are victims of the governments in the country. Why would we punish the victims by shutting them off and starving them since they're the victims of abuse by their own government? Do we want to, do we want to abuse the people in Syria who are victims of the Assad regime, or of ISIS for that matter. Two, uh, we should not cut back health programs because health programs, at least the ones you are run by the US government, uh, affect whether people live or die. If you shut down an HIV AIDS program, people will die they, because they won't have the antivirals. And it's certain death. Three, if we have a democracy building program to promote human, human rights, and individual three freedom by developing civil society, why would we shut down programs that are trying to protect human rights? It doesn't make any sense. So I think there are lots of programs that really should never be shut down. In fact, abusive governments that r abuse human rights shut our programs down. We've been thrown out of Russia now, when I say us, AID, out of Eritrea, out of Bolivia, and out of Ecuador. The Chavistas don't like us in Latin America. Putin blamed us for the uprisings against us. When I say us, I mean again AID. And uh, Eritrea believed we were tr trying to build a democracy revolution against uh, um, uh, the government of Eritrea some years ago, so they threw us out of the country But I was the aid administrator. Uh, if, if we go too far in pressing this argument for cutting back on aid, uh, we, in fact, may, on, on the longer term, uh, act against human rights. There are a number of countries that are now functioning parliamentary democracies that, in fact, were military dictatorships and abuse of it, and, and yet we had aid programs there, and their evolution into mature democracies was a result of that aid program. 
There are five countries specifically. South Korea, President Park was a dictator. He did abusive things, but he did transform modern Korea to what it is today. It was one of the poorest countries in the world. It's one of the 13th largest economies in the world right now. Taiwan, Indonesia was a military dictatorship. So was Ghana. So was Chile. All of them had large aid programs. We did not shut them down. And those aid programs did a lot to transform those countries into middle class democracies with private markets that respected human rights. If we were to aggressively shut down all of these uh, 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 programs in countries that were abusive to human rights, there are dozens of countries we would have to apply that to if we, if we use a very broad definition of human rights. And we would be shutting down the most important instrument of American power in the world that, would, that could transform the world and has been transforming the world to a more decent and civilized and democratic world order that protects human rights and, and the rule of law. I might also add, finally, if we aggressively carry out this program uh, to shut down uh, aid programs, then we will be turning programs off and on. And one thing that's not understood in this city is development, long-term development, takes 15 to 20 years. If you keep shutting the program off and then turning it on and turning it off because a country abuses human rights, you essentially are wasting a huge amount of taxpayer money. If you have a 10-year program or 20-year program and you shut it down in year five, all the money you spent, frankly, is wasted. That's why this is really not a very good idea from in, in terms of the taxpayers' expenditure of money. Okay. Thank you. I want to give Omar the chance to come back. We've used up the time for that side, but I want to give Omar the chance to finish up. But there's a specific point that Andrew Nats just made that maybe you would care to address, which is that U.S. aid having gone to some unsavory places like South Korea when it, was a when it was a dictatorship, brought about change. But can't you think of a lot of other examples where the opposite is true, where in fact we seem to be propping up that very dictatorship? I can think of many, many examples. Mobutu Sisiko in Zaire, uh, for 33 years he was the uh, foster boy of the, uh, of the, of the aid. And I can think of uh, um, uh, Mar Philippine under Marcos. Um, I, I recall in my early days working in uh, um, uh, development organizations that uh, Graham Hancock in his uh, book the, the, in the early 90s came out, Lords of Poverty, having you know, the uh, aid administrators dancing with Emilio Marcos, uh, wearing one of her uh, 4,000 pairs of shoes. Uh, <laughs> so that, is, that, is, that was uh, you know, a, a case that is there, and, and, and many others. But for me, I believe, uh, going back to my point, is that aid uh, has got three categories. And, 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 and the one that we talked about, and Mr. Natsios explained it very well, and I believe the, the, the military aid, which is part of the security package, and the developmental aid, these are where the interests of the country should not be superseded by the expediency of politics. I believe that there is an important element of the, uh, uh, the, the value that the American people put on, on, on aid, which is the value of promoting democracy, human rights, and freedom. And I think the government of the United States should reflect these aspirations of the American people. And that is where the conditions should be there. There are countries like Egypt, for example. We have put foreign aid in Egypt for the longest time. And we ended up with the uh, implosion of the Mubarak regime. And God knows where Egypt is going as we speak right now. So these are examples. There is a condition that, you know, it was a, a, a part of the uh, Camp David Agreement and all. But it's still, if there were uh, conditions that this assistance is hooked to the uh, human rights measures, that uh, the, we are talking about today, we'll see a different outcome in Egypt. Perhaps you have, we have seen an outcome like South Korea or Ghana, for the, for, for, for the example that uh, Mr. Nassius put out there. Okay, and Doug, let's go straight to you then, because that's getting into your field here, which is the security area. Um, can, do we have the luxury of not providing security assistance in some cases, even though there might be some human rights abuses by a regime? Well, it just depends, you know. We can all applaud the motivations of the Leahy Amendment. You know, we all wish that we lived in a world where we could always not support military and police forces that uh, conduct human rights abuses. We hope that we could cut off our aid to them and not support them. 
you know, but what if these troublesome fighters are the sole available forces to use against an even worse opponent? You know, to make this very practical, that's the dilemma the United States is facing today in Iraq and Syria in the fight against the self-proclaimed Islamic State. Uh, the forces arrayed against the Islamic State are, in every case, deeply problematic. And in two cases, the Kurdish PKK and Iraqi Hezbollah, often abbreviated as KH, they're actually formally designated terrorist groups. So while red lines, or at least pink ones, we certainly didn't do anything to the PKK when they helped uh, you know, evacuate the Yazidi, life gets very complicated when you have a designated terrorist group you know, providing a humanitarian assistance for a group that's facing genocide. Um, you have to look at the entirety of the anti-ISIL forces. Again, none of these groups, there is no group fighting against ISIL that has not, on the ground, that has not credibly been accused of human rights abuses. Of, in some cases of a rather substantial form. What does that, does that mean we should not give them aid? Does that, of course not. We have some other equities at stake. This doesn't mean that in the long term we don't want to transform these forces and get them to there, but in the meantime we have other equities. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Here's a way uh, to maybe go with this. Andrew Natsios gave us three types of aid that should be exempt from conditions. So before getting to where um, where we might have human rights or other things as a condition, protecting the victims in a civil war, uh, health programs, and your third again? Democracy, Demo democracy, democracy promotion. Democracy. Is that something that all of you agree on? Is that something we should say, raise, raise your hand, say, yep, those are exempt. We're talking about something else? Let me, let me just quibble with one, one point, and I rarely quibble with Andrew Natsios because he's my former boss. I still work for him at some level. But, <laughs> but, but, but uh, you know, Administrator Natsios. I know. <laughs> exactly. Administrator, so, but how about in situations where you have, there have been situations I talked earlier about we should, I agree with you in principle about f food assistance and humanitarian assistance, especially in situations like a civil war, but there was, during the Rwandan genocide, there was a particular moment where a number of groups said, we cannot actually provide assistance because the food is being diverted to... to uh, so I, let me just come back to you. It should be shut off. If, if the North Koreans would let us come back in, I would argue... Uh, I would argue that we should be able to go back in to North Korea and provide food assistance. I'm assuming you'd, you, would, you would agree with that. The, the, the only justification for shutting down humanitarian assistance if we're not assured that the rate bulk of the aid is going to the victims. If it's not going, then it's not carrying out its purpose. We should shut the program down. And we had a policy at AID when I was administrator. We offered the North Koreans a large amount of food aid because they have a continuing problem with severe acute malnutrition in their society. Their children are suffering. But we were afraid and we had evidence that the food was being diverted by the secret police and the military. We said, here are 10 things that are required if you want us to provide the aid. If you don't, we're going to ship the food every month. If you violate any of you, they agree to all the rules. If you violate the rules, the next shipment's being canceled. Twice, we, ship, we stopped the shipments. They went into a rage the second time, and they threw us out of the country. They said, we don't want you. They said, fine, we'll leave. Daniel, keep continue. So just, let me just make one additional point, which is uh, if... If we are in a if we're in a situation where we're forced to be in a country that is morally complicated, it, it seems to me that if we ultimately want to change the nature of the society, and I think we should, as I said earlier, I think we should be using all instruments of statecraft to support moving in the direction of human rights and t having countries join the rule-based order set up after World War II. That one of the things we should be thinking about is how we get change makers in a society out of their society to the United States for specific purposes. So I'm thinking of a country like Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, for the last 20 years, has had a program where they're sending 3,000 of their students outside of the country to study, mainly in the U.S., but elsewhere. It's having a profound impact on the society. As many of these folks go back to their country, uh, they're now in mid to senior level positions in the government and in business. They want a different kind of society. And I think we should, if we're going to have to take the long view on development assistance, so on democracy and governance promotion, we should be thinking about if we're forced to be in a society that's, that's morally repugnant or, or is doing things that, are, that, that we absolutely disagree with, if we need to be thinking about how, what are the instruments that we can use to change that society over time. Mm 
Okay. Omar, you wanted to jump in. Yes, a little. And, um, and, and this is from my experience in Somalia, for example. We don't have even a government there. So how are you going to deal with that mm -hmm. situation? So I, I believe the assessment should be that this is uh, – it was a functioning country and, 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 and had a government. However, there are people there. They are in need. And we have to look at – the, the humanitarian factor here, pure and simple, because there is no way that we can assess uh, later on a Shabab or, or these other you know militant organizations came to existence. But before that, at the time that where I when I was working there in '92 to '94 and and beyond, there was no government, and the 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 assessment should be that there are people in need of of aid. We are going to provide regardless of the uh, uh, the other dimensions. Of, of, of these human beings, and, 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 and that is a case where uh, it's one in a million, maybe, but uh, I, I will just add it there. Mm. Doug, let's turn to you. Uh, an easy example that already came up, Egypt. Egypt had a military coup. Over we, don't, we don't call it that. Exactly. <laughs> and why don't we call it that? Well, there, we have very uh, cut-and-dried laws. We do not provide... Uh, assistance to militaries that have engaged in coups. Um, therefore, according to the U.S. government, there was no coup in Egypt. Uh, we, also, we also don't say there, there wasn't a coup in Egypt. We just, you know, re we're and, agnostic on and that And Doug, question. play it out. So, <laughs> play it out. So, Egypt had a military coup. We refused to call it that. We did not cut off aid. Egypt is now throwing us out and buying arms from the Russians and cracking down in gross human rights abuses against the Muslim Brotherhood, 700 people executed in a day. Exactly. Uh, and Egypt is, uh, our, well, now, now Afghanistan is number one, so it's our number three recipient of, uh, of foreign aid. And uh, we have to wonder, you know, how much bang are we getting for our buck in Egypt? And is this a case where we probably don't want to cut Egypt off? That's too strong a signal. But is this a case where we could tell Egypt that maybe we need to think about a fairly serious reduction in your military aid to demonstrate that we're not happy with a number of things, starting with the coup non-coup, but then moving along through you know, your, your human rights abuses, what you're you know, doing to the Muslim Brotherhood, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we still have equities, but maybe we don't have uh, as many as we once did. And you think that's going to improve Egyptian behavior? Not necessarily, but then at least we're not throwing our money at them. <laughs> Omer, what do you think of that? Yes, I, 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 this, especially this, this point of changing behavior, because that is one of the things that aid will do. We want certain governments to change their behavior and, 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 and become more open, more democratic. And in cases, I, I came from Sudan, so, you know, uh, the, the regime in, in Khartoum had been consistently for 26 years frustrating every country that is trying to engage and to make this regime behave a little bit better than yesterday. So in that case, we, we expended a lot of time and a lot of effort, and, 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 and the U.S. at the end of the day were only engaged with the government in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the humanitarian assistance. There is very little that is going to, uh, as Mr. Nasser is saying, for promotion of democracy and, and, and human rights. And I think there is m more effort should be put there. And we bypass the government. It is not easy. And it is going to bring you all kinds of, uh, you know, um, uh, from the uh, new colonialism in Africa and the return of, you know, this or that. It's going to bring you all that kind of rap. But it is important to work with the organizations that are going to bypass the government. These are grassroots organizations, mm -hmm. civil society organizations, to promote democracy and human rights, to foster that change. Because without that, we are not going to see change, mm -hmm. and, and, and the violence and the atrocities will continue. Uh, 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 because these countries do not basically adhere to any of the norms that we, we adhere to. Uh, before I turn to Daniel, who wants to jump in, Doug, do you think that the Egyptian government is going to allow us to go to other organizations around them? Uh, probably not. They've been uh, quite uh, emphatic in uh, throwing out some of the U.S. aid. Con not, not yours, I guess. It's uh, NEDs, oh, oh. right? They, they threw out. AID is the largest supporter of IRI, NDI, right. uh, all of those. Uh, IFAS, they were the ones who were arrested, and they were exactly. running, working on aid programs. So, so no, effectively, no, no, no government wants people in there doing what they perceive to be right. undermining the policies of their government. 
So even though, and Andrew made this point earlier, we don't provide aid directly to the government in cases, we're trying to provide it other ways, how that government views that aid is going to determine our ability to deliver it. We have a thing called budget support, where we move money into the treasury of the government. We don't do a lot of it. I actually shut it down, except where I'm ordered to. Do, we were ordered to do it in Pakistan because we needed the military bases there. The, the Afghans were complaining that we weren't putting enough money through them, so we put some little money there. At Jordan, we did it, and we did it in uh, one other country, Egypt, for strategic reasons. Everywhere else, we didn't do it. Now they're doing a lot more of that, yeah. but it's still limited. Mm. Most AID money does not go through any government anywhere, even in countries that are democracy. Why? Because we're even in democracies, money disappears. Yeah. It's not accounted for. And it's not just that they steal it. They can't it sits in the account, it doesn't get spent because their institutions are so weak, they can't use the money effectively. Mm. Dan, well, let me just talk about this issue of budget support. I want to, uh, there's a, there are fads in international development. One of them is around the, the issue of, there's been something called the Paris Declaration that led to the Paris Accra Busan Global Partnership. It's, don't ask, but it's, <laughs> but it's, but if you go Google it, you'll know what I'm talking about. And so the upshot of all of these meetings was we countries need to take ownership of their development. So what that was interpreted as by the official donor community was we're going to write checks through the pipes of government agencies, this issue of budget support that, that Administrator Natsios is talking about. And so if we care about human rights and we care about civil society, um, one of the lenses when we make decisions about are we going to write checks through the pipes of governments, through budget support is this issue of human rights. If you're doing that, you're in essence strengthening whatever regime you have, and you're making decisions about I'm strengthening the current elites as they currently are. So there is a fad uh, at one point, DFID, which is a very respectable aid agency, um, saw it as almost gospel truth that all their their all their work should be done through budget support, and it's a bad idea. In the case of Egypt, I just want to talk about this issue of workarounds that we should absolutely be. Uh, working through civil society groups, we should be financing independent media, we should be supporting independent civil society. Let me come back to my point about trying to change the nature of the society. There, I do believe that with the several hundred thousand Chinese students that are studying in the United States that are going to go back home, that that's going to impact the nature of Chinese society in the future, and I think in a, hopefully in a positive direction. I think in the case of in a place like Egypt, we should also be doing the same thing to the extent that they're not letting, if they're forcing us to write checks through the pipes of their government, we should be offering to pay for a lot more Egyptians to come to the U.S. and study here. I think that, that over time that'll matter. Just, just one other point. I do think there are tipping points in some societies where if, if, you go to the, if, if they go to the World Economic Forum and you say, I'm from Country X, and you say, oh, you're, you must be a terrorist, or oh, you're, I'm from Country X, oh, you must be a drug dealer, that it gets embarrassing for the elites at some point. And I think that also changes the calculus of some folks in a society that we want to also find pressure points in the elites to say, this isn't, this isn't working for us. This business model that, of how we treat people, isn't, it's not so fun for me anymore. When I send my kid to a UK university, they say he's a terrorist or they say he's a drug dealer. It, I, at some point, the cost becomes too high. And I think we want to raise the cost for, for elites for their bad behavior. Omer, you wanted to jump in. And, uh, yeah, just the, and, and the point of bypassing. It, it is, um, I said it's not going to be easy, it, it, but governments are not good at thinking outside the box. So here we should bring other partners. The, the, the Googles of the world can, can, can bypass governments and, and work with people directly. They did it with the group of Wael Ghanem and those others in, in, in Egypt, and they created ways that these people can connect to each other. And, and, and with the world now wired, I believe it is a hundred times easier than when I was a student at the University of Khartoum and going out and shouting again at the government and they take me and throw me in jail and then three days later I will be going and collecting stones and coming back again. So now people having more you know, creative ways of doing this, businesses should, should do that and, and, the, and the government's hook for the businesses to do this is that if this country is becoming more democratic, if it is going to be balanced in trade and, and other things, you are going to have the opportunity to do business in, a, in, in this country uh, rather than, you know, uh, we are not dealing with these countries and then you don't have a chance to 
to, to, to open businesses there. So I, I think it, it is important that we bring other partners to work with us and then bypass these governments who will, and, and depend on the youth because the, now they are doing amazing things that you know, my generation and, and, and other generations older than, than us cannot do it. So the, the, there is a very good chance that people in Sudan or in, in, in Zimbabwe today or in Syria, they can connect with each other and the international companies that are working in communication, they can use that. And, and this is just one example. There are other examples where political parties in some countries can work with political part parties in the opposition in other countries and, and, and foster dialogue outside of these countries and bringing these people back, train them to work with other people on the grassroots level to raise awareness about democracy and human rights in these countries. Mm. I want to turn. Doug, did you want to jump yeah, in? Go just ahead. Really quickly. I mean, workarounds are great uh, when we can make it happen. Right. You know, this is only going to happen, I think, in three cases. You know, one, the state real thinks that the workaround is in its interest, and it was going to do it would do this anyway, or at least uh, you know doesn't mind that this is happening. Second, they don't really like this workaround, but they see it as the cost that they have to pay for some other good that they're getting for us from us. Or third, it's just so small they don't notice it. Those, but in the main. You know, countries, again, countries don't like other countries coming in and doing things that they perceive to be undermining the society that they live in, that they exist in, and that these elites are at the top of. Change threatens the elites who are at the top of a certain system. That's exactly, uh, that's exactly getting to the point I wanted to raise next as well, too, which is if we want to see long-term change, what, what Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice used to say was a balance of power that favors freedom. So that over time, you see a movement in the direction of freedom and democracy. We can make individual decisions in individual cases. I say, well, Egypt, you know, well, it's a problem, but we're not going to cut off all aid to Egypt. Or in the case of Sudan, well, we can do this or that, but we don't want to cut off because of the humanitarian or other things. But in making each of those individual judgment calls, don't we then fail to make a long-term differentiation between the countries that are doing things right and the countries that are doing things wrong? Well, let, 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 let me put this in a larger context because we're speaking in an abstract way. There are countries in the world that are abusive of human rights, Ethiopia, for example. But if you go to Ethiopia now, and I've been going to Ethiopia for almost... 27 years now, Ethiopia is going through a profound economic change. And there, there may be corruption. They, they mowed down 100 students and protesters after the elections 100, uh, 10 years ago where uh, the, the, the ruling party almost lost. However, it is not a predatory regime. They are developing the country. They're building roads. They're building the largest dam in Africa. Their health care system is substantially improved. Their, their, their food security is improved. They are attempting to build the economy. They have a 12 percent growth rate. They're not looting the economy to steal all the money to move somewhere else. Now, are, it's the same kind of regime that was in South Korea. It was the same very much like President Park's regime, who built modern Korea. Was he abusive? Yes. But was he doing good for the society, which in the long term created a middle class, that caused the uprising that led to a democratization of South Korea. That is what's happening in, in, South, in uh, Ethiopia now. A middle class is developing, and they, they know what they're doing, that ultimately they are creating the dynamic that will cause the dictatorship to, be, uh, to either be overthrown or to gradually evolve, which is what happened in South Korea. It'll happen in Ethiopia. And should we be giving aid to Ethiopia? Yes, we should. Because the evidence is they are using the aid constructively for the purposes for which it was meant, and there is a imp substantial improvement on the lives of people. There's, there is growth. Now, is everything ideal? No. Should we? This is the way it really works. We negotiate with these governments. We say, look, you like the health programs, you want the, you want the agriculture, but you need to allow us to also build some. No, we don't like the civil society program. They would tell me. I said, we just, we just want the other stuff. I said, no, you can't have just the other stuff. You have to have both. Daniel? That's how we work. Okay. Okay. Daniel, do we give aid to Ethiopia? Uh, we, Should we? We, sh we give aid to Ethiopia, but I think we should be pushing on this issue of technology that Omar was talking about. I think we ought to be empowering as many people as possible outside of the government and outside of the ruling party. We ought to be 
we ought to be pushing as hard as we can to get to that day when it's not a one-party state. And I also think that um, there are things, like I said, we can be doing on supporting independent media, supporting various parts of civil society. It could be environmental groups. It could be uh, women's groups. It could be young. Uh, it also, but I, I do believe that um, we don't have to take, they can't just offer, tell us this is what we want and give them a blank check. We, uh, we ought to be absolutely pushing as far as we can to operate from our principles with, within some constraints, but I think we ought to be pushing as hard as we can in the direction of human rights. Okay. I'm going to come to the... Way, I agree with that, but that's what I just said yeah. in different form. <laughs> I'm going to come to the audience next after this last question, and I'm going to pose it to Omar first, but I want you to be thinking of what you'd like to ask, and I'll be calling on you. If the U.S. is engaged in providing security assistance, and we do this all over the world, Colombia, Iraq, allied countries, Egypt, and though those countries are engaged in serious repression of human rights, possibly even using the assistance, the arms, trained personnel that we've provided. What should the United States do about that? One professor at one time told me that if you, if you were faced with a difficult question, you can always say, it depends. <laughs> and then you take, and you take a pause. It depends. <laughs> so people think you are intelligent. Uh, <laughs> you, it depends, uh, because seriously, uh, 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 countries like, like, say, for example, Egypt, we are giving security assistance, which includes the, the, the military package. And we have seen, we talked about, uh, about how bad it was managed and how bad the country uh, the trajectory had been uh, be because of this. But we will think in the absence of that what will happen. So, but again, we have to have these conditions that the security of that country is supposed to be part of the security of the United States as well. And this is where some, some of these questions were lost in the war on terrorism. Because we, we look at this as Sudan, for example, a bad country, you know, we are not supposed to give them military assistance, but Sudan had been reportedly in bed with the United States when it comes to intelligence and working to combat terrorism. So in that respect, you are looking at what the security of the United States, and, and this is because of the bargaining power of the United States, rather than looking at also, in the same vein, what is the security of the Sudanese people look like? So it is not a one-way street that building on the security of one country so that we can benefit from this as a security of the United States alone is not going to work because at one point that is going to be threatened. So the mutual security respect is, is important and the conditions that are going to be put forth to not to allow this country to abuse the security assistance because the, in, in Chad, for example, or in, in, in Central Africa Republic today, if the United States is looking at anything that is related to security, we are only looking at combating Boko Haram, for example, or the other, you know, but we don't know what the people of Chad and the people of Central African Republic uh, security threats are. So th it is important for us to look at that and also put the conditions that this security assistance cannot be abused by the country or by the government to actually provide more insecurity in their own countries. But Doug, uh, I, I want to bring you back in again. It sounds good. Here are the conditions. We're, we're only going to do this if you agree to these conditions. I remember, for example, um, renditions after 9-11. Uh, after Syria was a good example. We said, we're going to return these people to you, but please don't do, you know, don't do anything to them. Saudi Arabia as well. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how good their follow-through was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please don't do anything to them, but we will have someone sitting outside the door to get the report. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't do that anymore. You know, look, security, again, it depends. I like to break down the security assistance in, into two pieces. You know, the, the security assistance that goes to the country when it comes to you know, transferring technology, transferring weapons, um, give the giving of weapons, even the permitting of arms deals, that needs to be thought very seriously. Although, again, there are 
you know, we also have to look at the world market. You know, if we don't give someone arms, someone else will, and we have to be cognizant of that. Um, but then there's the security assistance that we give by bringing these officers here. And I think this needs to be looked at almost more as an education program along the lines that Dan was talking about. Now, of course, this remains very controversial because, you know, famously the, the Salvadorans who were involved in the, the killings of the, the Jesuits and nuns in El Salvador were educated here. And, and the demonstrations still happen at Fort Benning every year on the anniversary of that. But I tell a, a countervailing story. We generally look at Columbia as a positive example. When I was a young officer at Fort Benning, we had a Colombian officer who was associated with us. And uh, a number of us, I wasn't in the car that day, but I heard the story later. A number of his colleagues took him to a baseball game. And one of the, the guy was driving too fast, got pulled over, wrote a ticket. They, they drive away, and the Colombian looks at him very puzzled and said, well, why didn't you just pull out your ID card and show him that you were a military officer? And of course, you know, this is an army town. The guys outside us don't like us very much, so we're like, oh, that would have doubled the ticket. That gave, us a, <laughs> that gave us a very interesting conversation, though, the next day about, well, we're a professional army, and we don't get any privileges here in domestic society. And, and by the way, if you want to be a professional army, you really ought to start taking some more steps that direction. So what the, the militaries pick up here, what their officers learn from seeing how Americans live in society, how American military officers live in civilian society, I think it's something very important along the same lines of what Dan's talking about, what the, the students will carry back to their home countries. Mm -hmm. From the audience, do I see a hand? I see one here in the back right. I see one on the far left there. The, I think the mic is closer to you, sir, right now, so... We'll go, oh, we have one coming here. Very good. Ma'am, go ahead. Thank yeah, you. Please Hi. introduce yourself. Yep. I'm Shannon Green. I'm the director of the Human Rights Initiative at CSIS and the colleague of Dan's. So you probably imagine where I fall on this issue. Um, but I wanted to quibble also with two of the carve-outs for health programs and for democracy, human rights, and governance programs. Even when they don't get routed through the government, there are programs that can continue to support an authoritarian regime. For example, if you're providing rule of law assistance or sort of court administration support in a country that's abusing human rights, that can strengthen the hand of a judiciary that isn't independent and is acting sort of at the behest of the government. Same thing with health programs, right? You can be delivering an assistance in a way that favors certain communities and builds or shores up your support in those communities. So I'm curious about whether the panel would support the idea of sort of doing an assessment or having a litmus test, even within those sectors, of whether that support strengthens the hand of the regime or if it, in fact, starts to build um, those independent voices and communities that ultimately will be needed to usher in a more democratic Let's direct era. that to Andrew, uh, because those are your criteria. How do you execute those criteria well, effectively? Yeah, uh, we can debate this a lot. I have to tell you that most ineffective programs in the democracy field are rule of law programs. They don't work very well, and, and uh, even in democracies, they don't work well. And, and I have a theory as to, I mean, there's a big debate in the scholarly community as to why that is. I think it's because the elites know if they lose control of the legal system, they lose control, period. And the thing that distinguishes a highly advanced society from, and that is free and democratic is an independent judiciary and the rule of law. The, the greatest gift the British gave us was the common law legal system we inherited before, that existed for 150 years before the revolution. That is why we are here as we are. It's because of that legal system. It is very difficult to build that, particularly over the short term. So I'm not even sure that it helps the authoritarian. It doesn't help anybody, frankly. It's done because the American Bar Association thinks it's a wonderful thing, and Congress has a bunch of lawyers, and they say, why aren't you doing these programs? Well, quietly, the aid people said, Andrew, these really don't work very well, but we'll do it because we're under pressure, and they keep attacking us if we don't do them. So I, I don't agree with you. They really help the regime at all. They don't help. They're, they're, in a, they're relatively ineffective on either side, but we still do them. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to try to experiment with them, but personally, we do things in the city because of pressure groups from Congress and lots of but, – but effectively in the field, that's not the most – the most effective thing AID does in the field is build civil society. And now in Egypt, Egypt does not allow us – it is the most – controlling country in the world 
other than North Korea. I don't think there's an exception. Okay. But the Egyptian government will not let us give any money to civil society. In fact, when our mission director, I won't mention his name, and the U.S. ambassador supporting the mission director was doing that when Mugarab collapsed, they were both fired. The State Department recalled the USAID mission director and fired him because the, uh, the defense establishment in Egypt and the police were livid that we were giving aid to these small civil society organizations that were not controlled by the Egyptian government. And our mission director was fired for doing it, and the mission and the, and the ambassador, U.S. A career ambassador, was fired too for the same reason. By the way, he wasn't even, they didn't even tell him. They just put it in the Wall Street, leaked it to the Wall Street Journal, and he, he found out about it in the newspaper that he'd been fired. It sounds like a case for cutting off aid to Egypt. Is that what you're arguing? No, I'm arguing, <laughs> I'm arguing that, you, you, that in certain regimes, do not live under the illusion that you're going to be able to do these kind of programs. Mm. Daniel? So I, I think Shannon's point is a good one. It's a little bit to my point about this budget support and, and sort of picking winners with the assistance money. So if you're only going to do... Uh, certain kinds of set up health clinics in the region where your clan is, that's that's a problem. Or the sorts of rule of law and your your rule of law is is awful, is absolutely atrocious. That's a problem. So I, I take your point. Let me let me ju so I agree in principle about that. Let me put a slight nuance on that and say it's something for us to think about, which is we now have the emergence of a global soft power competitor in the form of China. And this hasn't come up yet, but I wanted to talk about this. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, I talked earlier about they're pragmatically amoral. I can guarantee you that ultimately they're going to make all sorts of noises, but they're not going to follow the marquee of Queensberry rules on human rights. They're not going to follow the marquee of Queensberry rules on the environment. They'll make some noises. Oh, we're going to look at what the global standards are, which is the, the World Bank standards or the Regional Development Bank standards on this, but they're not going to follow it. And I think one of the comparative disadvantages that we've had is, is to reflect our values, which I am completely in favor of. It's now become so hard to do infrastructure projects or certain kinds of projects because it takes two or three years of assessments of the kind that you're referring to, which I agree with. So we, if we're going to do them, which I think we should, we're going to have to do a heck of a lot better job of doing them on a compressed basis. Not, I don't think we should sell the family silver on our values, but we're going to have to uh, realize that we have somebody now breathing down our necks in terms of saying if it takes us five years to make a decision about a project, the Chinese will just say, well, here's the money and let's get going. Then we've got a problem. So I think we have to balance this. So I, I take your point. Let me just make one other point, which is about military assistance. I just want to come back. I just think this issue of what happened in Mexico this week is very unusual. We didn't cut off our relationships with Mexico. We have a great relationship with Mexico. It's one of our most important trading partners. It's, either our, it's our second or third largest trading partner. They, we are their largest trading partner. We have a, we've come a long way in our relationship. We've done a lot of things to be their partner. But even still, we fail. There was, I think, the administration's credit. They said we want to send a signal. We're going to cut out of the 30 or so million in military assistance. We're going to cut five million of it. Very unusual to send a signal that you are not. It, what has happened with those students in Mexico that were killed is totally unacceptable, and the steps that are being taken are not adequate. And you're and and you're our friend, and we should be able to have straight conversations with each other, and this just isn't acceptable. Andrew, address Mexico. Isn't this well, going to backfire? Let, let me just mention this larger. It's actually the opposite. Uh, Kim um, Elliott it, it is at the uh, Center for Global Development. She did a multi-volume study, a huge study, of all sanctions regimes the United States and the Europeans have established since the World War II. How effective have they been? And it's quite fascinating what the results are. The results are that for our adversaries, our enemies, they're almost ineffective. So we do all this stuff, Cuba, North Korea, etc. It does not change their behavior. There's no evidence it changes their behavior. They have very little change. It does when we impose sanctions on our friends. There's a much high, and the reason is, one, it embarrasses them. Two, they want good relations with the United States, and they don't like you know, their public thinks that the United States is their best ally, and yet we're getting sanctioned. What's going on here? And so it does put pressure on them mm -hmm. on things like human trafficking and all that. We had very close allies like Israel and Greece had terrible records on it, and they changed their behavior because they were so embarrassed by being put in this State Department mm -hmm. record. I have to say, though, it does create the impression that we are attempting <laughs> to transform the entire world and muck around everybody's society. And there is a certain arrogance to it, I have to say. 
and, and I understand why we do it. And I hate human trafficking of any kind anywhere, uh, and I support human rights. However, uh, there is a there's a limit to it when it becomes counter uh, productive. And s our friends in other countries will say, I have been Sudanese tell me privately, Andrew, if you go too far, even the civil society organizations will oppose what the United States is doing mm -hmm. if you go too far in it. So there has to be a balance. Okay. In the back row, um, please introduce yourself. Try now. Try now. Hello? All right. Excellent. My name is Isaac Makos. I'm a student at American University and an intern at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, and my question is about, so there's been discussion of security assistance, but about the security side of other assistance. Uh, couldn't, cutting off or couldn't cutting off assistance uh, drive uh, or increase support for non-state groups, groups that might be opposed to the U.S. that can offer to provide those services, social services, economic food, that sort of thing. Uh, if the U.S. cuts off that support because of human rights concerns, couldn't that increase the popularity or support for groups that might be uh, more harmful to U.S. interests? Right. So this is a Hezbollah or a Hamas Hezbollah. or something. Yeah. Omer, would you address that? Yeah, and, and also we have seen that uh, the, the Syrians that we trained in the first, uh, you know, test, they left the uh, equipment and they ran away and then the government took. So uh, it is case by case. I think in, 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 in certain cases where you cut off aid or, or cut off military assistance to, to send a, a message, like uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Nassius is saying, I, I think it is important and that depends on whether the, these are uh, friends or, 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 or foes. But we cannot say just across the board that cutting off assistance is going to, to help or going to harm. It is case by case, and um, we, we've seen where this worked, and we've seen when it was counterproductive. Uh, however, in, in principle, I would say if the country does not respect human rights and, 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 and is not willing to change, and that is why basically in North Korea or in Sudan or in these places, nothing is working because this countries are, uh, are hell-bent on doing what they are doing, abusing human rights, because the cost for them is, 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 is almost zero. They, they, they don't have anything to, to, to lose by killing uh, 300,000 people in Darfur, for example, except you know, some of us is screaming out there and calling it genocide, and then in the same breath we say, we cannot do anything about it. Uh, so w w cutting that aid to regimes like this is going to send a message to both the regime and the others that, you know, if you don't behave, we are not going to give you a chance to benefit from the aid that we are giving. Because what are the other insurgents or, or those people in the opposition want? They want to take that chair and they become the government tomorrow. So I, I would rather give them their lesson today, <laughs> democracy one-on-one, -on -one before they go there and, 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 and they become the, the government tomorrow. Mm. Daniel? I want to make a, respond to your question. I want to just respond to something that Administrator Nazio said, which is, I think, so I think we are competing with other forces for the hearts and minds of, of, of people. And so I do think that our assistance is not only correct, and, but it does, it, if we aren't there, it is true that others can move in. I also think that in the case of, say, Hezbollah, I can remember that they were handing out cash and at the end of the 2006 war. I'm not, and it was very, we were moving far more slowly. I'm not saying we should be handing out cash as a good idea, but I do think we have to think about, as we do our work, we, better, we have to be cognizant, not only are we doing our work, but we've got these competitors out there that are, are going to use different sorts of approaches, and we, have to, we just can't operate as if we're the only game in town, if I can say it that way. I do think we are the only game in town, though, on, on some of these other issues, though, Andrew, which is that this issue of trafficking in persons or human rights. And I, I, I hear that uh, there are a lot of countries where we don't enjoy high approval ratings, but I think if, if it's not the United States, who will lead on these issues? We, if we are the, and, I, and I know you're not saying that. I'm not, I'm, what I'm saying is we should use – uh, the reason it's, soft, it's called soft power is it's supposed to be more subtle. And what we do on human rights issues, we use a giant sledgehammer. We pass, bash their heads in. The best kind of change that lasts is not revolutionary change. We didn't actually have an American. When the American Revolution was not a revolution, it was the British were the revolutionaries. We were trying to protect the system we had in place, and the British were trying to change it. Okay? So if you look at revolutions in history, they usually end up in bloodbaths. 
they often, they seldom result, with some exceptions, in, in democratic progress. The best kind of change is slow, incremental progress. And that's what the best aid programs do. They wear them down. They make progress in press freedom or in, uh, in, in, um, in developing civil society. I mean, if you look at some of these countries, what they were before AID started, and then 30 years later, you'll see there were changes, big changes. But they didn't happen all at once. They had happened slowly. And, and they stuck as a result of that. If you see the changes that took place in South Korea over 20 years through AID, you'll see the country was very different in, when it was in, 2060, in 1961 when Park took, took office and then when he was assassinated in 1979. They were a big change, but they were slow and incre over almost a 20-year period. Okay, we have um, right behind this gentleman first, David Kramer, uh, former president of Freedom House and now senior director for human rights at the McCain Institute. Great, thanks very much, Kurt, and thanks to the panelists for a terrific debate and discussion. I, I wanna present uh, the Egypt case, drill down more on Egypt on to this side of the panel. <laughs> Egypt uh, has not only engaged in gross human rights abuses against its own people, it also went after four American organizations. It wasn't IFAS, it was IRI, NDI, Freedom House was one, and ICFJ was the, was the fourth, as well as Conrad Adenauer. So my question is, if you don't want to condition assistance to the, the Egyptian government, and military assistance, I think, is the main point that people bring up, we continue rather mindlessly, I would argue, the $1.3 billion in assistance, the military assistance to Egypt every year, as if 2011 never happened. If you don't want to condition that on the human rights situation and what they have done to the United States, to Americans as well as others who have been supported, including a gentleman sitting next to me, what, do you, what would you do? Sanctions, targeted sanctions well, against the officials who engage thing with the Egyptians because is this being recorded? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> well, I think I should be careful, okay? Please, please dealt, share your personal I've story with, with the everyone. Egyptians, and I know particularly who made the decision in this case. I'm fed up with dealing with her. I'm fed up with the arrogance of the Egyptian government, the corruption of the Egyptian government. It's, and I, I was in Jordan once with King Abdullah, and I said, you know, if only the Egyptians could take Jordan as a model and, and behave more like the Jordanian government. I knew it would enrage the Egyptians. Of course, it was in all the newspapers, and it did. It enraged them because, of course, they think of, of the Jordanians as far inferior to the Egyptians. The, the Jordanians are trying to make progress in all these things. The Egyptians are not. They're playing us, and we're letting them play us. But should they pay a price? Yeah, I do they think should. that we should pay a price. And, and we shouldn't have an aid program they that big. Should, they should pay a price. What we should not do is down. take aid to zero, be, yes. you know, say they had, a coup, they had a coup, therefore it goes to zero. And I think that's what our, our side is trying to defend right. here, that these black and white red lines that allow for no prudential judgment um, on the part of the implementers <clears throat> can be, are, are not in all cases, but can be counterproductive. To, to say that Egypt had a coup and take their military aid to zero, I think, would be counterproductive. But, you know, a nice, you know, a, a sizable slice in it to make sure, you know, to send a very clear message that we are unhappy with all the behavior you detailed um, is something that a policymaker may well want to consider. I, I pers personally, on, on, on the, not the military side, I would say because of the, I mean, they've killed more people in the last two LCC. Then, the, then Mubarak and Sadat and, and, um, uh, and Mass are killed in all those years. I mean, the atrocities, being, you know, there are atrocities on the scale that they're committing them. And it's the security services are completely out of control. I, I don't think we should be putting any money through budgets. And the Egyptians are extremely insistent that the money has to go through the Egyptian state. My view is you want the help, it's going to go through aid contractors and NGOs, and if you don't like that, I'm sorry, we're not going to do the program. All right, let me ask everybody here as a follow-up to this, though. Isn't this a big problem for the United States that we have in Egypt that is not only cracking down on human rights, but is also uh, reorienting itself away from the United States, away from the alliance that we had towards Russia, towards a very different role in the Middle East. How do we change that behavior? And is going after the aid or pushing back, cutting in some way, is that going to change that behavior or is that going to reinforce that behavior? 
So I just I would just say a couple of things. One is I do think that one of the things we have to think about is they've got they can go down the street to the Russians, which is what they've been threatening to do, and say we will take our business to the Russians. Which for a while that wasn't necessarily in the cards. There was a period where Russia wasn't as active, and now we've got a problem now where Russia's in the Middle East. I think the second thing is how much. What is the actual size of their of the aid package vis-a-vis -vis their economy? I'm, I'm assuming it must be more than a hundred billion dollars. I can't imagine it's more than one or two percent of the GNP of Egypt. No, it's, small. it's re relatively small. It's relatively GNP, small. Yes. I think. Um, I do think we absolutely should be insisting on I, – I also – one of the questions I'd want to understand is, is okay, I'm assuming much of the arms that have been used for these, for these atrocities have been, have been American weapons. I mean, this is a uh, – this, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's, 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 it's a really thorny and an awful problem because we have a lot of interest at stake in Egypt. We have the Suez Canal. Uh, they're a neighbor of e Israel. They are the largest Arab state, I guess, in terms of population, 90 million people, 85 million. So uh, there, it was part of a political deal, the Camp David Accord. So the, the assistance is seen through the lens of a, as a political as, as a is a political deal. It's not necessarily seen as a as a development. Um, uh, it's not necessarily. It's it's sort of a political first and security and then development. Okay. Let's, let's Andrew. One last thing on Egypt, okay? The reason I wouldn't shut the program down, I would tr try to just tell the Egyptians, we want to help you, but we can't put the money through your government because of what you're doing. However, can you imagine what Egypt would be like if it descended into the chaos we had in, in Syria or Iraq? Mm. It's, it's not just 85 million people. It is the most densely populated place on Earth. 90% of Egypt is a giant desert. Without the Nile River, there is no Egypt. It would not exist. Where would the 85 million people go? To Europe? To Israel? <laughs> hey, where are they going to go? And the Nile River right now, there's a dam being built in Ethiopia called the Grand Renaissance Dam. It's the largest dam in Africa. It's twice the size of the Aswan Dam, okay? It's going to, th and depending on the estimate, there are different studies, a 30% reduction in water flows into the Nile River. The Egyptians threatened at one point to bomb it. El Sisi, not El Sisi, Morsi did. He threatened to bomb the, the dam. The, the, the Nile River is in very serious trouble, even without the, 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 the dam. Egypt is, has got massive development problems, which if they are not handled, we are going to have a failed state in our hands. And I don't think we can afford, from a humanitarian standpoint, a development and a strategic standpoint, to have that happen. The Egyptians are, in my view, the elite. They're the reason why the thing is screwed up. They will not deal with some of these issues because they're afraid Mubarak constantly said, stability, stability, stability. We don't want anything that's going to cause any kind of unrest. I said, that's fine. Then you'll just go down the tubes over a longer period of time. That's all. Because <laughs> that's what you're doing. You're ignoring everything. We, we have, Kurt, I think Doug. what we're bringing out here is that, you know, there are a list of things that we need to think about before we think about dialing down the aid. You know, to, to summarize what Andrew's been saying, you know, is this a regime that's working its way out of a job or not, if they're an authoritarian regime, you know, whether deliberately or non-deliberately? You know, is this a friendly state or is this a not-so-friendly state, and how are they, therefore, likely to respond to our prodding? Um, in the case of, is this a state that's in the middle of a whole bunch of unstable states, and therefore, as much as we really might like change, even a little bit more st instability in this region is probably not something we want right now. Um, whereas if it was in the, mm -hmm. you know, the middle of Europe, we could probably put up with that. A whole long list of things yeah. we need to think about and not make these binary choices. Okay, thank you. There's a woman in a red uh, top there. If we could get the microphone to her, she was the first to raise her hand. Thank you. I'm Sugan Wardner Warren. I'm with the Open Society Foundations and formerly of Freedom House, my ex-boss is sitting okay. in the audience, David Kramer. He didn't make me come. I was really interested in the topic. Um, <laughs> this is a fascinating discussion. So from Egypt, let's turn to another non-corrupt country, Burma. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Natsios especially, but to the panel, well, was the U.S. demonstrating prudential judgment um, when we lifted sanctions so quickly um, with Burma, um, given that there is a, a situation of the Rohingya, which is in a pre-genocidal state, 
We have elections happening next week, and everything is really up in the air. So was that a smart move in terms of our foreign policy? Thank you. Well, we didn't initiate. I mean, the, the Burmese government initiated, and the Myanmar government initiated, and they did it for a strategic reason. They're, they're sitting in an area of the world that has a giant country with $1.4 billion, uh, people. Dollars, people sitting on top of them, and they're getting a little nervous. That's the reason the regime changed. It's not because they love democracy. They want to get close to the United States, and they realize the condition for doing that was some easing up of, uh, of, of civil liberties, some uh, beginning transformation of their regime, and we're seeing resistance now. We'll see what happens in the elections. I am, I am, to be very candid with you, skeptical. But I think we should be holding their feet to the fire. We have an aid program. The one, one of the young men that I promoted uh, because he did such a good job, Chris Milligan, is the mission director. I have great confidence in him. If he's allowed to do his job by the State Department, Chris will figure it out. He's very capable. <laughs> and he's committed to human rights, I might add. Dan? But the problem is the Burmese government is really not cooperating. Right. Well, I think this is an interesting example of, I, this was an example where the Chinese overplayed their hand and mistreated the, now this is not, this, this is a very corrupt elite, they're massive human rights abusers, but uh, they had some questions about what's our exit and what kind of relationship are we going to have with China? Do we, do we like being, there was some sort of mistreatment around some kind of a project with the military elites that was some sort of a, a, a moment of clarity for the Burmese elite. Uh, and they, they were the ones that came out of the cold. What I, I do think when countries exhibit some, you know, hopefully some sort of credible signal of wanting to have some kind of rapprochement, we should at least we should hear them out. I do think we should hold their feet to the fire. I absolutely think uh, we should be using the fact that they want a different relationship with us as leverage. Assistance is part of that, but I think it's part of a larger conversation. I can think of other countries of uh, Kazakhstan where it's less of a where it's less specific to um, to to you know it's less extreme but you know it's not a free society I think uh, Nazarbayev won his last election with 98 percent of the vote um, but let's, it, let's, it, they have a different Burma, relationship than with China and so we're, we, we ought to take advantage of it yeah. let's bring in another question my name is Mike Albin I, I have a bean counter kind of question uh, it has to do with the theoretical discussion we're having here and also with the with the movement of appropriations through Congress uh, for uh, for uh, development aid or aid in, in general. Uh, one of the problems, as I see it, is that the American public does not understand what uh, what aid is, what foreign aid is. There are very few mechanisms they can use to, uh, to, to understand this. One of the ways I try to understand it is through the reports of SIGAR and SIGIR. Uh, and there are comprehensive reports of, of aid programs in both Afghanistan and, and uh, formerly Iraq. Uh, there are almost no reports, auditors' reports, investigators' reports coming out of USAID. Before this meeting, I checked the AID uh, 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 auditor's website, uh, Inspector General's website, and there have been two in uh, this year so far, For just what? simply two. Uh, uh, auditors' reports in, in oh, USA. There, there are hundreds of auditors. They're not on. The, they're not they may on. Not the, be on the website, but believe me, they're there. Well, they ought. My, my point is, they ought to be on the website. Similarly, similarly, State Department's uh, OIG is is uh, also way behind the times. Your if, question. That that's it. Is there a way we can improve this within the bureaucracies? Thank, Thank you. Well, I, I have to tell you, I wrote an article for. Uh, a, a, widely read article that's on the, the, the um, website of the Center for Global Development. It's called The Clash of the Counter Bureaucracy and Development. It's the consequences of the way in which we do audits, which are highly confrontational, and frankly, half the time, a lot of it's very sensationalist. The, uh, the special IG for Iraq and Afghanistan were highly politicized. And the stuff I'm seeing from the IG in Afghanistan is shameful because it's so inaccurate. A lot of the bad, in fact, I'm doing a chapter in a book right now, and I'm looking at their audits. Their audits completely ignore the fact that 451 aid workers, people who've worked for AID, have been murdered by the Taliban. 800 have been seriously wounded in attacks. These, these aren't little accidents. These are, they're assassinated. 
Some of them have been beheaded. And they do audits completely ignoring the security situation. Why do you think the audits are so bad? And they are bad in some cases. And it's because the people are being murdered in the middle of the programs. Mm. Two, the State Department tells AID all the time, and the De Defense Department, where to spend the money and why to spend the money. No aid officer would ever spend the money in those places. The bad audits are almost always what we call political programs. I'll give you one example. There's a gas-fired electrical plant that was built, which I refused to build. When I, and, I, and Karzai attacked me at a lunch in front of the president. And the entire the cabinet, our cabinet was there and their cabinet. Mr. Natsios will not build the electrical power plant. I said, you can't maintain it, and we have no money for it, and we're not building it. The president said, why, you know, and we had a big <laughs> fight and fight in front of the president. Okay? And now you're at the George H.W. Bush yes. uh, uh, no, presidential no, no, no. center, not yeah. the George W. Bush. That's, this is that. But, th but, but we built, uh, eventually was built under pressure, and guess what? There's a terrible audit on it. The IG for AID at least had the intellectual honesty to say at the end of the audit in a footnote, we told the State Department this was a terrible idea not to build it. It was built, and it says in the audit, because the State Department wanted Karzai reelected, and he said, I need to have this plant rebuilt. The fact that it doesn't work and won't work was irrelevant. It's a political aid program. That's why AID should be an independent agency that reports to the president as a cabinet member and not to the State Department. It was a stupid thing to build. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. But who is taking the abuse now? Is it the State Department taking the abuse or the Defense Department? They're the ones that told aid to build the thing. Okay, thank you. I'm we sorry, but... One Thank you. That's a solid answer to your question. In the red uh, shirt there, the gentleman, that'll be the final audience question, and then we'll come to our last uh, final round. Hi, thanks you. Thank for a great discussion. Franco Bastida with Security Assistance Monitor. So um, pertaining counter-narcotics, specifically, and involves State Department and Department of Defense. In the past six years, and it just involves some countries, the U.S. has funded as number one, Afghanistan, second, Colombia, third, Mexico, fourth, Pakistan, and the fifth, Peru. And my question is, what message does the United States send to the world when it supports abusive regimes that have conflicting discourses? And what behavioral changes can it actually elicit? And this is in the context, and I'm going to give two examples, of the Mexico Security Initiative and um, the assassination and repression during the Chilean government by Pinochet. Who would like to take that? Well, I, yeah. Omen. Go ahead, go ahead. Omen. Let's bring you in. <laughs> I think this is, this is a stark example of what we were talking about here, is that, you know, th there are bad regimes out there. And the United States... Uh, of course, it's not the police of the world, and, 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 and we cannot punish everybody. However, I think we have a way of looking at aid that is a little bit outdated, I think, today, because we only look at it at, at the time where we, we have to punish somebody or we are going to deprive this person or we're going to take it away from that person. I think that the case of Ethiopia, and, and you made a, a very good case, Mr. Natsis, that, you know, Ethiopia is developing now, and, you know, but there is no democracy. This is a precise time where we should say to Ethiopia, you know what, you are doing well, but if you are not doing these other things well as well, we are not going to help you. Because we, they, they see the cost of not being able to be in the good books of the world. That is where you will become more effective. Not in the case of Sudan where we go and we say, we give you aid or we don't give you aid. They have their mindset. It, it, these are like people, like horses in the, in the race field. They look at one direction and they have already made their calculations. So it is very hard for us. That is why we need the soft power. That's why we need to work around them. That's why we need to change situations in a different way. But for those countries that we have the ability to affect, we have the ability to make the change reasonably uh, without a high cost, we can come to them and say, look, we work together. You are benefiting from what we are giving you, and you are doing well in this one, two, three, four sectors. But guess what? We are going to stop this, or we are going to, to reduce this, and you will feel the crunch in one, two, three, four sectors. So work with us, and 
the cost for you is going to let people demonstrate in the Freedom Square or you, uh, somebody will write uh, uh, an article in, 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 in a magazine or, or in a newspaper. The, 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 this will lead me to something that I will talk about later, and, and, and that is the, what, what is the, the, the principle, what is the high pillar that we have as a country and as a people that we hold very you know, uh, dear to us and we cherish the most? That is freedom. Any American in the street, you stop them and you, t you say, the first thing that comes to your mind as an American, then you say, my freedom. And so if that is the case, we have to look at this as not just the freedom of the people of the United States, but the freedom of the other people that we are dealing with. And we have to keep that as one of our basic measures for what we can do to help the other countries achieve. Thank you. And I hope you come right back to that in one second. We're going to move to our final round, which is to ask each of our participants in one minute or less, you don't have to take a full minute if you don't want to, Give us your bottom line recommendation. What should the United States do right now to improve our handling of foreign assistance and human rights? Daniel Rundy. Uh, the U.S. should lead with its values and use all instruments of statecraft to push in the direction of greater human rights. It's in our interest to have a freer world and a world where, other pe where people's human rights are respected. We will be safer. We want countries to participate in the rule-based order set up after World War II that we have helped develop. It, it, we, do not, we, can, we can and should use foreign assistance to help create that space through education and training. We should be creating um, independent media, supporting uh, civil society. We need to be cognizant, though, there are, uh, we can support human rights, and we can also balance that with the other values that we have and, and that we also cherish. We don't, it, 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 so human rights is something that's important to us. It's, we should, uh, principles matter. It reminds us of who we are and that we should, we should always be cognizant of our principles and start from there first. Thank you. Omar Ismail, your bottom line. I believe aid is a tool, <clears throat> and we have to use this tool wisely. And it is not for punishing people or rewarding them for good behavior or bad behavior and, and, and having a score. It is a way of promoting ideals. It is a way of promoting ideas as well. It is the, uh, a way of promoting business. It is a, a way of promoting culture. It is coming back to the taxpayer, the American taxpayer, in terms of the stability and the, and, and, and the, and the, and the good governance and the, 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 the best behavior of these countries dealing with the United States in the international arena and in these individual countries. That is why we should tie it to one of our highest values. And the highest value that I think of is the freedom, democracy, and respect for human rights. These are values that the, all the American people share. And if that is their money, and if we are their government, then we should take these values and look at how we are going to translate this to promote it in the world without being, you know, uh, without going out there and being the police of the world and preaching these high moral values. And then we, uh, people turn around and find us dealing with regimes that are not keeping these values at heart and they are not even capable of changing into something else. So we have to use okay. it wisely, and we have to make it effective where we can change the behavior of others. Thank you. Thank you very much. True to our values. Douglas Ollivant. All of us agree that we want a world in which human rights are more observed to a wider group of people to a greater extent. None of us disagree about that. The question facing us today is, is a strong linkage between aid and human rights in the short term the best way to get us to that end? And it appears to me that we've discovered that we have a number of binary systems, the Leahy Amendment, most notably in security assistance, where we turn aid off if certain things happen, not giving any discretion to any policymaker who might think that, that there are better ways to go about this. And I'm glad the Burma example came up because we also have the same thing in the opposite direction. And it strikes me that in the case of Burma, we turned the switch on or back on much too quickly before we were able to see 
Is this year's election going to come about? How is Burma going to do in integrating not only the Rohingya, but the other minorities on the periphery? And most importantly, in my mind, you know, we didn't seem to notice that their constitution gives 25% of the seats to the military and requires 75% plus one to change the constitution. Those are some things we could have conditioned, and we could have given smaller increments for the changes that we saw three years ago. I think, and, uh, and, and save some of these for this year and later down the road. Okay, so a little nuancing. Much more nuance. Andrew Natsios, you spent five years as a U.S. administrator. You're the envoy in Sudan. What is your bottom line? What the bottom is your... line is that humanitarian programs in conflict zones are, are in a natural disaster. Health programs and democracy-building programs should not be used as a weapon to try to get human rights, because what you're doing, in fact is compromising human. If you're dead, you don't have any human rights. A child that dies from malaria, a million and a half children died from malaria last year, or I'm sorry, not last year, 10 years ago, because we've reduced the rates dramatically. But tell the, the parents that the reason we cut the aid program for malaria is because we don't like their government. The kid's still dead. We stopped immunizing children from polio because we don't like the government. Tell the child that gets uh, paralyzed, that uh, they're going to be paralyzed the rest of their life, but we're punishing their government by not doing uh, polio vaccine programs because uh, we don't think the government has a good uh, record on human rights. I, it makes no sense to me. And the notion that we're supporting one area or another, I have to say that's a lot of baloney. A child is a child, and if the child doesn't get immunized against polio and they get polio, they're paralyzed, whoever, whichever province they're in. AID tries to do it equally all over all these countries. It doesn't have health programs to support one uh, province over another because of the government insisting on it. We insist on equity when we do these programs. They're based, the health programs are targeted based on need. There's a whole formula, a mathematical formulas we use based on infection rates for diseases, for example. Those should never be subject to, uh, used as a sanction or a weapon. Now, we should not be providing budget support in countries with abusive governments. I think we need to say, I'm sorry, this is one of the conditions that if you want money to go through your, even in small amounts, through your uh, treasury, then you are going to have to comply with international standards and human rights. I would support that. But I think for civil society, democracy building programs, disaster relief, which is, by the way, the law anyway, it's been the law for 50 years that we do not allow, uh, we, we have a notwithstanding clause in all disaster relief. That's, that's, mm -hmm. And then the health programs. They should be cordoned off. The rest of it should be nuanced based on the country and try an interim incremental approach. We're not trying to capsize the entire society. We want gradually to improve the human rights situation so it's permanent. It's not temporary. Thank you very much. I think this is a very difficult and complicated issue, but I think we've heard tonight one of the most illuminating discussions of these issues that I've certainly seen, and I hope you feel the same way. Th please join me in thanking our debaters. And that concludes, that concludes our debate for this evening. I want to thank you all for coming. Please go from here and be ambassadors for the McCain Institute. Tell your friends, come to our next debate, which uh, I believe in Washington will be December 3rd. And we'll be talking about Europe. Thank you. Thank you.